All right. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Portland Cocktail Week Distance Learning. It's Josh Davis here with Lush Life Productions. Uh, I know you guys are used to seeing me over on Brown and Balance, man, but hey, I'm getting to have with two really, really cool guys today, uh, Scott Richardson and Eric Mitchell from uh, Argonaut and from Jermaine Robin, the two brand ambassadors for the uh, this, this today's class. Today's class is going to be on California brandy. We're rediscovering California's native spirit, man. I'm super excited. Uh, I don't know a lot about California brandy. I've been able to enjoy uh, some of their products from a little care package these gentlemen sent me. So uh, I'm feeling really, really good about it. And I can't wait today to learn, you know, a little bit more about the history, about the process, everything that goes into this wonderful juice that's in these bottles. So what are you guys doing today? Doing great. Doing, doing fantastic. Great. Thanks for having us, Josh. Hey, no, thank y'all for having me, man. I know I wish I was out there in California hanging out with you guys, man. I'm in Chicago mm -hmm. and it's uh, about 50 degrees, and I would love to be in Cali right now. <laughs> Enjoy it, man. But I'm super excited about today's class. I'm going to step out of the way because I really want to hear from you guys, and I know everybody online wants to hear from you guys. Um, everybody, this is part one. We have a part two coming that we're going to touch on and we're going to get to. It's going to be something special for you guys that are watching coming. But definitely pay attention to part one because you're going to need it for part two. And I'm going to just leave it at that. So with further ado, Scott and Eric, the floor is yours, man. Do what you guys do. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Much appreciated. So, I mean, I think you can really um, trace California brandy roots back quite a ways. And what's really fascinating to me is there's this really lost history um, of, of California brandy that, um, you know, if, that really didn't exist uh, or is in the knowledge banks of many people uh, that are in the either the wine professional field or the spirits professional field. And this lost history really starts with the California missions. And if you think about what the California mission system was, uh, it was part of the, the uh, Franciscan monks that were basically building a, a series of 24 missions that existed throughout California. And of those 24 missions, 21 of them actually had large vineyards and also wine and brandy making facilities. And the grape they brought was actually the mission grape that we know it as, but it's called Liston Prieto. They identified it through genetic uh, testing. And that grape actually still exists in South America uh, under a synonym Criolla or Pais. But what's fascinating about it down there is they're just starting to make it into wine again, but for decades, it's only been used for brandy production. So California really, you know, you had about 140 years of the California missions really controlling this. And they were really the first recorded people uh, or entities that really had any sort of, um, you know, knowledge of brandy making in California, even before California was California. But that all changed during the gold rush. Uh, the gold rush actually starts in 1848 in Sutter's Mill. It started a little earlier, but um, Southern California, but we were still part of uh, Mexico at that time. And in 1848, what really started to happen is they discovered this, this, this gold rush and it changes the dynamic of the the people living in California. I mean, Scott, you know that like when we did, uh, you know, we did, did a couple other seminars, you, we talk about, um, you know, how important there was it just people coming from land that uh, showed up for the gold rush or were people coming from other places? Yeah. I mean, just thinking about the population of California at that time, again, like before it was officially minted a state, you know, quickly swelled by 300% and San Francisco alone by, over 2000% in such a short period of time uh, and, and connecting it to, to brandy in the sense of, uh, you know, when, when miners struck gold and had a little extra gold dust in their pockets, which was such a common currency at the time, uh, you know, their spirit of choice was often California brandy. I mean, it was a much more palatable and approachable and finely tuned spirit at that time, um, especially relative to whiskey, which, which, which was just so much harsher, um, but much, but more affordable for them, certainly in the saloons. Right. Um, so, so looking at, looking back at how that is connected to brandy, and then we'll kind of see a little bit later today, um, how that ties in with Argonaut specifically in, in some of the, uh, storytelling and the aesthetics, which is pretty cool, but yeah, you know, spearing off of what you're saying, Eric, um, it, it, brandy was the spirit of choice back then for, for those miners that did have, um, some extra gold dust in their pocket. Absolutely. I mean, and, and what's interesting as well is, I mean, it goes back even further than that. He, George Washington, during the Revolutionary War, said only when French generals showed up would he get brandy to drink. And other times he'd have to settle for a lesser spirit. So kind of an interesting story there. There was always a preferred spirit. And, 
if you look at like, you know, the demographic of California at this point in time, you know, it changes dramatically. Prior to the gold rush, it was really more in the nature of kind of like 90% either Hispanic origin or people from Mexico or, or Spanish people that were born in California. And after the gold rush, that changes dramatically. You have people coming from China, people coming from all over the United States, South America, all over Europe. Uh, so a massive influx of different cultures and they really preferred brandy. So this kind of ushers in the next uh, period in, in brandy production. And it's really kind of the, the, gold, the, the brandy train, which uh, really has, uh, a big impact on transporting brandy across not only the United States, but also allowing for export to Europe. And if you look at the date of the Transcontinental Railroad, 1869, you see, you'll find that that kind of coincides with this devastating phylloxera epidemic that was attacking Europe at the time. So basically, this is a little, if you're not familiar, it's a little vine-eating, almost microscopic insect that eats the, eats the roots of the vine and destroys all vineyards. And it took them you know, a few decades to figure out they could graft onto American rootstocks because phylloxera is native to the Americas, but it wasn't native to Europe. And if you look at the type of vine that 99% of all quality wine comes from, the Vitis vinifera vine, that vine is native to Europe. And so basically we're introducing this pest that that vine species had no uh, defenses against, so it just destroyed it. So Europe needed alcohol, they needed something, right? And, and there's no, you know, uh, refrigerator controlled uh, temperature uh, shipping back then. So you really, the only thing that could really handle these trips were either heavily fortified wine, which is where some brandy comes into play, or brandy. And so a lot of brandy got shipped and it was just one year where you saw this happening. And it kind of ushers in this golden age for California brandy. And the golden age really is from like the late um, 1800s, kind of like around 1891, California produced 600 thousand gallons of brandy. That's like more than we produced after prohibition and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the very next year, we distill 1.8 million gallons of brandy. And a lot of that's going to Europe. If you think that 1891, 600 million gallons, and in 1892, Germany alone, or Europe alone, purchases over 400,000 gallons. There's just like a, a, an explosion in the market. So this really creates this great market for California brandy, probably from the late 1800s to early 1900s. And then we get our next uh, slide, which is uh, prohibition. So um, not only was this devastating for all alcohol producing entities, but it was de especially devastating for brandy producers. And the reasons why is because you know, whiskey or grain-based distillates, you know, you can get a grain crop in the ground almost every three months or certain times a year, but grapes really require, if you remove your vineyard, you need a good two years, maybe three years to get a proper grape crop. And so all the vineyards that were destroyed during prohibition really took, uh, you know, really devastated the, the, the brandy market and caused this, you know, separation. And then, you know, you look at what happens after prohibition, um, you know, you see like the Great Depression take hold. You see, um, you see the, um, you see people's taste changing. I mean, you know, they didn't have a lot of money, so they're moving towards a, a lesser priced spirit. And brandy was always a premium spirit, and so they move in this direction. And then the whole model changes after prohibition. So before prohibition, it was that small artisanal pot still, a lot of small people producing brandy. And after prohibition, it goes to column still production. And so brandy and whiskey almost resemble identical production methods at that point in time. World War II draws the labor effort out, so there's nobody to really make it. Um, and by 1960, you're looking at like almost a zero market for brandy. Uh, they, it only grows four times. So it's it's not a huge, huge bump. And there's all kinds of other things that happen in between here that, that caused a, um, caused a kind of a, a decline. Uh, Gallo actually releases their first brandy in 1968. They actually started distilling in 1938. Scott, I don't know about you, but I'd love to get a bottle of that first uh, E&J Gallo brandy. They're having yes. stuff in barrel for 30 years and then that's their first release. I was like, hey, let's let's do this. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that way. <laughs> Wasn't there wasn't there a like a, a law in the was it late thirties or early forties sometime that, that yeah was about in, in, in nineteen thirty eight the California realized that you know they were losing so much you know industry uh, that they lost during prohibition 
that they enacted a law that grape growers were required to distill a, per, a percentage of their crops. And I've heard it's 45%. And so, and age it for two years in wood. And so that kind of like built up stores of brandy, but a lot of that also went to fortification of wines at that point in time. Uh, if you jump to 1970, uh, there's four producers that control 90% of the brandy market, Ian J. Gallo, obviously, uh, Christian Brothers, uh, Paul Masson, and Corbell. And so all of this stuff at this point in time was really column still distillation. And even at this point in time, the image of California wine or brandy products really didn't have an international reputation after after they'd had it before prohibition, but not after prohibition. So we really needed a watershed moment and we got it with the judgment of Paris. And this was something that really, you know, if you're not familiar with what this is, it was a, it was a tasting that was held by a gentleman named Stephen Spurrier. He took two, uh, he took some California wine, uh, Cal Napa Valley Chardonnay, Napa Valley Cabernet to Europe uh, to Paris, and he held a tasting, a blind tasting, with a group of French uh, critics, uh, restaurateurs, uh, some ex expatriates that are there from the U.S. and other places. But uh, it was all people really focused on the French wine market, and two California wines won. Uh, and it was pretty fascinating that that you know everybody thought there's got to be some mistake. Even Odette Kahn, who was the uh, the uh, the head of the Revue de Vente de France in, in, in Paris demanded her ballot back and Spurrier said, no, ballots are final, that's it, you know, this is what you get. And uh, she never talked to him again. So it's one way to lose a friend. So what happens after this is really like, this starts kind of a watershed moment, not just for wine, but also for other types of produce from California. And so you really see, it wasn't until uh, Hubert Germain Robin uh, stepped in in 1980, in the early 80s. And I'll talk more about him later. But what was unique about that is he was one of the first people to bring a, a, a pot still back to California. And you had a couple other players in there as well, but none of them really focused on uh, wood age brandy. And so as time moves on, you get this renewed interest in quality brandy. Um, you know, the, I mean, who can forget the, the whole, um, you know, Cavassier's, you know, 600% jump in sales because of, uh, because of Busta Rhymes' song, who actually prefers Hennessy, but uh, he thought Cavazier worked better in the song. I always thought that was a neat, neat story there. Um, but, you know, Cognac, you know, blows up the market. So, you know, as, as you know, as, as more people get exposed to great brandy, they, they, you know, move to other directions. And so it just really helped with, with educating people on craft quality brandy from California as well. By 2011, there's over 30 craft distillers in California, um, you know, in the USA, excuse me, all producing brandy. A lot of them are in California. Uh, we were actually the largest brandy consuming nation until uh, 2012, and then China surpasses us. So it's not just America that's growing its brandy market. It's all over the world. And so with Argonaut and Germain Robin, uh, Scott and I will both talk about and plenty of others that are that are high quality brandy being produced throughout the United States and, and particularly in California. I think there's just a really bright future for California brandy. But California brandy has something very unique about it. And I think Scott's going to tell us a little more about that. Yeah, you know, one of the most reoccurring themes today will be about the grapes, uh, and rightfully so. Just as you would imagine a whiskey producer speaking about the whiskey's grains used in the mash bill, as we're all familiar with, there are far more implications, I would say, to speak about the grapes used in California's wines that are destined to become brandy. Uh, and on this next slide, as we kind of dive into this, this first step, looking at these raw materials that makes this so unique, um, you know, the number one thing that makes California brandies based materials so different from, from not only other brandies around the U.S., uh, but also like outside of California, but also just around the world in general, is quite simply the fruit forward nature and the new world style of these flavorful grapes that we're able to use in California. And, and, in, and in this state, we're so fortunate to have almost every type of wine grape known to the industry that we are able to experiment with in the brandy making practices. So as we dive into this, um, these next couple steps of the process here, you know, it's important to understand that without California's incredible climate, climate it wouldn't be possible for a wide variety of grapes to be cultivated. And this is due to so many microclimates throughout the state. Uh, those of you listening who are, you know, very familiar or even just slightly familiar with wine production, um, especially in California, you'll you'll absolutely be able to relate to a lot of this that we'll talk about today and, and to some of the best practices of brandy making. Climate and harvest are both 
so important to this idea of provenance that I like to talk about from time to time, especially for a, a truly craft spirit. And this is my favorite aspect of California brandy because it's what contributes to the uniquely Californian flavors and aromatics that cannot be replicated anywhere else in the world. Uh, and to make the best California brandies, you really have to harvest the grapes at lower sugar levels than you might think, um, or especially than you think for making a fine a fine wine that's just destined to be consumed as still wine. And we might get into, into some of those details a little bit later too, as we talk about specific brandies, but overall a, a very gentle approach to harvesting will ensure that we have the most pristine grapes for brandy production. And all this basically means that we have endless opportunities for flavor exploration. So you'll see here more than any other category of spirits, I like to argue that it's a more significant and interesting discussion to highlight the raw materials of this style of brandy uh, due to the due to so many flavor profiles that you can expect to have in the liquid, even before the oak and the maturation has anything to do with it in the process. You know, in the world of whiskey, um, just because, you know, I, I like referring to whiskey because a lot of us are so familiar with that category in so many different ways. We talk a lot about maturation and blending and the art of all of that, and rightfully so. And there's a great discussion to have in that realm within California brandy, but I'm really talking about before that even happens, this clear spirit, spirit off the still is such an incredible representation of these grapes and such a wide array of these grapes. Um, so let me just give you a, a few examples of different grape varieties um, as we kind of stay on the slide first a little bit as we can really visualize um, um, the, the different grape varieties across red and white grapes that we're able to to experiment with in California and, and ultimately make some really good brandies. So like Columbard, for example, if we start with some of the white grapes, um, this will give the distiller notes of apple, pear, some really nice floral aromatics with a, a really balanced mouth mouthfeel. And this is a great uh, wine grape to use as a base to build a very complex California brandy off of. Um, and so you'll see that come through in some of the transparency we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, Chardonnay is another grape um, that can, can really add some nice notes of apple and pear, but more interestingly, some pineapple and even some mango notes as well um, with some heavier oak influence characteristics as it can handle aging for longer periods of time. So that's just a couple examples from white grapes um, that you'll start to see as we go across the board and, and, and you'll see in some of our blends that we are leveraging a lot of different unique white grapes and, um, and the innovation that comes behind that. And then in the world of red grapes, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to speak to some of the really unique ones um, we found success in and, and, and some delicious results um, uh, over decades of California brandy innovation. But Pinot Noir is one that I know Eric will have a chance to talk a little more about um, later on, adding complexity, some really nice cherry notes and, and awesome textures to the final brandy blends. Grenache is one that you'll see come through a lot. We love the red, red raspberry notes that this grape can offer and almost a slightly oily texture. So even flavor and aromatics aside, you can talk about the texture on, um, on the palate and how that can influence a, a really artful blend at the end of the day. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of the importance that California wine grapes will have on the brandies that seek to experiment with them. So on this next slide, you know, I like to introduce this idea the, the, of innovation and the freedom to innovate. California is no stranger to this, of course, in, in many ways. And, and the same is, is absolutely true for brandy. The loose guidelines around American brandy production really do allow producers to optimize the processes to make the best brandy possible. And this reality span, uh, spans across the major steps of production from grape to glass. Um, so I, like I mentioned about the wide ranging flavors of, of California wine grapes, you can really visualize the palette of colors we can use to prepare for distillation. And speaking of distillation, it's important to understand that compared to the more popular spirit categories we, we all know and love, there's, there's relatively fewer uh, rules regarding distillation and even oak aging methods of not only California brandy, but also just American brandy altogether. Um, so I'll speak a little bit to the distillation side um, of innovation here on this slide. And then, um, and then as we get through distillation, uh, Eric will be able to kind of follow up with some, some interesting notes about barrel, uh, barrel selection, barrel aging, and then blending techniques. But 
right here is a glimpse of the McCall Distillery in Sanger, California. This is one of the oldest distilleries in the state, and it houses 20 660-gallon Alembic pot stills built by Robert Prulo of Cognac, France. And I mentioned that name because um, it's the most, arguably the most renowned craftsman, um, the gold standard of cognac, traditional cognac stills. Uh, and this type of still has been used for literally hundreds of years in making um, some of the best brandies around the world. And when we, um, since we were able to utilize these stills in California brandy production, uh, we put those freshly fermented wines um, from these California grapes through two stages of distillation following that traditional double distillation method um, as they do in places like cognac but these it's so it's so special that we have these stills imported um, from France that were originally manu manufactured um, in cognac and are able to uh, really reassemble them here and um, and uh, and utilize those old world meaning new world brandy making techniques so let me tell you Oh, yeah. Scott, I think the interesting aspect of this as well is that um, that even in cognac, right, even at the major cognac houses like Hennessy or Cuvier, uh, having twenty to twenty six of these type of pot stills is is what they have. They don't have, you know, there's not a there's not a, a, a brandy distilling place in cognac that has a hundred of these pot stills. So we have like probably the largest selection of pot stills outside of uh, of Prula pot stills outside of France. And the other thing that's fascinating to me is they actually. They actually hired Robert Prulo himself to come over and set up all these stills. So he was in the in the in the Sanger facility himself, putting those. He stayed here for about three months, uh, assembling all the stills himself. So great history. Yeah, there. yeah that is a great that is great history. Um, and, and truly, just just you know, a great story about the authenticity of these stills and and why it still makes so much sense to you know pay homage to traditional brandy making techniques. Although we're always trying to push the limit of the innovation within California. So. Let me tell you really briefly before before we move on to the next slide, why why a producer might want to use these traditional cognac style stills in California brandy. So the distillates that come off of these um, can really create a more complex spirit, giving a richness and elegance rather than highlighting really individual specific characteristics, um, arguably maybe even less complex characteristics, but super pointed um, flavors and aromatics of a particular grape that's being distilled. Um, and so uh, although these stills are um, also these stills are ideal for spirits destined to age for longer periods of time in oak. Um, now, if we move on to this next slide and kind of compare and contrast, I think it will help us just understand um, the different types of stills that we um, that we have at our fingertips here in California. So we're not only limited to using those, um, we can also use column stills or also coffee stills, um, as we call them sometimes. Now, with this type of still, we're able to separate the elements of the spirit more cleanly to target specific characteristics, um, like a really focused fruit note or floral note, kind of as I was mentioning in contrast of the, of the last slide. Um, and you can really target those specific notes to come out of that one type of grape you might be distilling. Uh, these, these stills can be engineered to remove specific congeners with such a high degree of precision and that ability to, to sort of fine tune the exact components in the, the new make spirit enables the distiller to produce a more consistent profile regardless of some of the inconsistencies that that may uh, get into the actual feed when you start that distillation process. And my favorite way of kind of understanding the use of these two different types of stills um, that we're talking about is through a simple analogy. Um, I like to say like at a theatrical play, there are stage lights and spotlights. So which type of lighting is better? Well, it definitely depends um, on what the entire stage is trying to convey, right? So I like to say that stage lights are like the traditional copper pot stills. Sometimes there's so much happening on stage that the ambiance of stage lighting lets your eyes wander across all of the individual characters um, without any single one of them really stealing the show. Uh, in other words, allowing the distiller to bring a well-rounded experience to life, showcasing depth and complexity rather than in, um, highlighting individual aspects of that single grape. So in contrast, you have spotlights that I would say are more like the column stills or the coffee stills, highlighting a particular actor on stage, just like a distiller would want to highlight 
very particular flavors in a final blend. So it's really interesting to think about how we can how we can utilize those those two ways in California brandy. Um, I think uh, Eric might want to talk a little bit about uh, the aging process um, um, as we kind of wrap up this piece before getting into some of the blending characteristics. Yeah, I think it's a you know fascinating subject matter to think about all the different types of oak you can utilize. I mean, with Germain Robin, we use uh, Vicard uh, air dried limousine oak because we're really modeling it on a cognac model. But uh, Sky, we, they use what for Argonaut? They use a different barrel altogether, right? Yeah, for Argonaut brandy, we primarily use ex bourbon barrels. Um, we really like the neutrality that a once used bourbon barrel um, can offer us because we 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 want the mellowing of the spirit to happen and we want to get some of those some of those spice characteristics and some slight you know nuanced vanilla characteristics but we don't want to risk overpowering those fruit and floral aromatics from that new make spirit um, which can just really make a California brandy shine so so we we for Argonaut really like those ex bourbon barrel characteristics. Yeah, so I mean, you can use any type of oak you want, but I mean, it's also timing. It's also, you know, with the age of the barrels, uh, some of the barrels we use for Germain Robin are over 100 years old, and I'll talk more about that a little later. Uh, but the, on our next slide, we're going to look at like the, the fact that, you know, what's also integral in creating or crafting brandy, because you do want it to be somewhat similar as a brand from year to year, um, is the blend process. And the blend process is, is, is fascinating. So uh, this is David Wartner, our, um, our, Wartner, our head distiller at, uh, at Gallo. And he's often mentioned that it takes them up between six and nine months to actually get a brandy through the trial trial and error process of blending. And I, I've actually out requested samples before from them. And they said, yeah, we're working on something. We'll send it to you. And I, I, I taste it and I get a call back like three weeks later. And they're like, no, no, throw it out, throw it out. It didn't turn out that good. You know, we got to go back to the, the drawing board and do it again. So it's just this, this trial and error process where they keep looking for that. And they also have to give it a little time in bottle or in a barrel to really uh, come back together to where they can see what the final uh, blend is going to look like. So this takes about six to nine months. Um, once it's once the final blend is completed, this goes into a barrel for about three to six months to marry. It has to come back together, as I mentioned before, before bottling. And what makes it unique is you think about what they're blending. They're blending, you know, brandies of different ages, brandies of different uh, varietal, brandies uh, that, you know, may have dropped, you know, because of their age, their alcohol levels drop below what's what's bottling strength. So all of that has a big play uh, in brandy. And I kind of sum it up with this next slide in comparison to, we talked a lot about California brandy, and, and, and we like to compare ourselves against cognac quite frequently. And the reason for that is that, you know, cognac, if you think about the region, it uses one grape variety, it uses uni block, and they're not going to be able to change that just because growers, mostly growers are growing the grapes there and they're selling it to the cognac houses and the growers just don't have an incentive to really do anything to, to, to make those changes. It's going to be a slow, slow process, maybe over 30 or 40 or 50 years where you'll see a change in plantings. And still to this day, 95% of everything planted in in cognac is uni blanc. And so they deal with one grape variety. So you think about that one flavor profile, it's like you're, if you're painting a painting, right? Like this Starry Night painting, what if Van Gogh had tried to paint that all with just beige? You know, you could do different tones of beige, but it's all gonna be beige. How exciting is that gonna look? I mean, cognac's a great product, but they are limited in, their, in, in the base material for their flavor. So this is what makes California brandy supremely unique. And you heard Scott mention about red grapes as well. You know, there's not, any hardly any producer, you know, major brandy producing areas around the world that utilize red grapes on on, a, on, a, on the level that we do in California. And it's a much more difficult grape to distill. And uh, it's just one of those things that really offers up more and more flavor profile. And so if we hadn't had prohibition, if we go to this next slide, I mean, I think, you know, the potential for California brandy really is limitless. So we just started in 1982 or 83 uh, producing stuff that's in barrel. And what you need to produce great brandy is you need time and you need it to be, you know, you need that age process to see what's gonna happen in the barrel. So we're on, on the track, uh, it'll just keep getting better. So the potential is here, but I think Scott wants to talk to us about uh, one of the special brandies we produce, which is Argonaut. Yeah, we like to say that Californians were destined to make brandy for many reasons. and. Wow in the spirit of American ingenuity and the deeply rooted California heritage within the Gallo family, Argonaut Brandy was ultimately created. But first, what exactly is an Argonaut? What does that mean? 
Um, well, on this next slide, we can kind of dive into some of that little ethos there, which ties back to even some of the, you know, California history that that Eric started us off with. Uh, the Argonauts were the original fortune seekers during the gold rush era. They left everything behind to settle westward in search of adventure and opportunity during these times. And, you know, it was the energy and conviction over time of these Argonauts that truly laid the foundation for the state of California, which has become an incubator in so many ways um, for, for all ambitious sorts of people. So we really like tapping into that spirit of California um, and those founding days to create a uniquely Californian brandy that's uninhibited by many of Europe's rigid restrictions in old world brandy making. So on this next slide, this is an image of our head distiller and blender for Argonaut brandy. Her name is Rita Hansen, uh, also known uh, as the brandy queen, as we like to call her. Her experience of over 20 years across winemaking and spirits making is illustrated through the really innovative blends of Argonaut uh, that she has the luxury um, to create and, and be more transparent with than just about anyone else um, in, in this part of the industry with California Brandy. And we'll talk more about that, that, uh, that level of transparency when we go through each of the expressions of Argonaut. But I like to say that it's, it's in my opinion that in the world of craft spirits nowadays, trust is the new currency. And so this mentality is evident on the back of every bottle of Argonaut. So let's take a look at some of our expressions. This first one here, um, kind of like I was hinting at, you know, printing the blending grids on the back of every bottle is unparalleled in the industry. And so we tried to kind of blow that up for you. It's a much smaller grid when it's physically on the back of each bottle, but you can kind of look at it alongside the bottle, um, you know, on this slide. And these grids really highlight the the grape varietals, the still types, and the exact age statements of each leg of brandy that contributes to the final blend. So you can really kind of start to, to pick it apart and, and look at why the brandy tastes a certain way because of certain influences that we've, you know, begun to, to discuss with California Brandy Innovation. So um, what we have here is, is, is the Saloon Strength, which is a slightly higher proof Brandy. This is really built to be the ultimate bartender's best friend for a California brandy, and and, and literally because it's it's available only to bars and restaurants um, at the current moment. So uh, I, I know by experience, bartenders absolutely love this one. Um, there's there's a lot of amazing ways that this can stand up into such a wide variety of cocktails, especially due to its proof. Um, but it, it it just creates that. Um, that that perfect balance of, of a spirit that can act like whiskey more than any other category in a lot of ways with cocktails, but you still get so many of those fruit and floral aromatics with this one. Um, before we move on to, to the next expression, I'll kind of leave you with one, one little um, cool thing about this that, that I like to point out in the blending grid. You see the first two lines there, a two-year-old leg and then a 19-year-old leg. And you might think that that Rita Hansen was, was crazy for blending such, such vastly different aged, you know, um, legs of brandy into into our kind of um, uh, cocktail workhorse expression, right? But she would be the first one to tell you that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so if the quality of the final blend is is better when combining some of our oldest and youngest barrels, then that's what matters most. Um, so with Saloon Strength, you'll really get some nice fresh cut red apple notes dipped in caramel um, right off of the nose, um, but then some some really nice um, some really nice uh, uh, dark fruits, candied citrus peel, uh, black raisin notes. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that you'll see from, from these grape varieties that contribute to those apple and pear characteristics. Um, really well-balanced brandy. But we move on to speculator. Um, one thing that you'll start to see is that uh, we're starting to incorporate some of the Alembic pot still distillates alongside some of those uh, coffee or column um, distillates that you see on this blending grid. So we're gonna start adding more complexities here and, and, and some of, the, um, some of the, the best from both worlds, um, as you might say. Uh, Argonaut Speculator is made to be a, a bit more of a, a lighter style with more floral and citrus forward. Um, notes and just a little bit more of a, a, a dry finish on this one is what I take away from it. One, one thing that's really cool I like to point out is some of these Chardonnay um, characteristics here. You know, I mentioned that one grape earlier um, just because you can really pick up some unique cooked pineapple, papaya, even some mango notes with this one. And that definitely comes through in the final brandy blend here. Um, so it's no surprise that 
sometimes I see more uh, craft rum drinkers appreciate this expression uh, more than the others, uh, for example. And, and, and you can point it to some of those instances like the Chardonnay grapes, which will contribute some of those more um, tropical styles as well. Uh, this, this type of art, uh, this style of Argonaut can play really, really well in warmer months, particularly. And, and if you think about your French 75s, uh, your juleps, your sidecars, even some of my favorite modern classics like your gold rushes and paper planes. Um, I mean, this one can 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 really play well across all of those, having so much fun um, riffing in, in many different ways. Um, you get more brighter green apple notes on this one as opposed to some of the more kind of luscious red apple that I think you might get on the previous one. So Loon Strength, we 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 uh we talked about floral aromas are are really bright here. You you get some of that through the muscat grape um, that that blended into here um, can really go a long way on the nose um, and and it really helps the way that we're blending this with with other uh, grape distillates here um, uh, that that those those floral aromatics are, are just as powerful as some of the fruit um, the, uh, the fruit flavors and so this one can really stand on its own being a very unique expression of California brandy and then this third one here fat thumb this is really the richest style, perhaps best for spirit forward cocktails yet. And I mean it when I say incredible to sip neat on its own, just or even just over a nice block of ice. Um, you can really have confidence using the fat thumb with classics like your old fashions and your Manhattan riffs. Um, this is personally my favorite. Um, usually I always have a bottle of this right in front of me anywhere I go. Um, but uh, uh, I'll just kind of get straight to to a, a comparison here as we've talked a little bit, Eric's talked a little bit about about cognac and some old world brandy making techniques. Um, you know, th this fat thumb is really interesting because it's it's more elegant in, in the sense like like a really fine cognac. But unlike a cognac, it's it's use of both types of stills like those stage lights and spotlights. Right. Because you're going to see more of the Alembic pot um, still distillate in this blend. Um, it, it really allows allows the final blend to to highlight those red and white grapes, as well as those uh, a, a hefty amount of both types of distillates from those stills. Um, so you really just get the best of all worlds from old, from the old world brandy making techniques and the new world um, on this one. Baked apple cobbler and date jam and nutmeg and clove. You get some of those holiday spices, but it's still something that's vibrant and fruit forward enough to play throughout the whole year. Um, in, in, in all in, in such an array of cocktails. Um, but like I said, keeping this kind of simple to like your three ingredient classics and, and really just in, um, enjoying on its own is, is, is my favorite way to, to enjoy the fat thumb. So that really concludes my portion specific, um, specifically talking to a lot about Argonaut Brandy and, and the expressions um, that we have here, but I know that we might have a chance to discuss some, some Q and A and, and, and kind of wrap up um, after Eric gets to gets to um, go into Jermaine Robin and, and, and talk a lot um, more about the future of California brandy. But I just want to say that I'm honored to be on the, the forefront of Argonaut and to, to work with Eric on our ultimate goal of showing the country why California brandy should really take its place in the pantheon of quality brown spirits. So uh, I'll hand it back to you, Eric. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Um, I think one of the great things, too, is, I mean, I used the fat thumb and uh, I'm not just going to say it, my award winning or winning cocktail creation for our internal spirits BU competition. So, uh, <laughs> so Scott, Scott gives, gives me some stuff about that. You're not, yeah, you're not going to uh, keep that trophy um, for much longer. I, I, ha I have the belt to prove it. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that I won the competition. I don't know. We need a new one soon. So we got to got to work on that. Um, but let me tell you about Jermaine Robin. So I think uh, it's an honor for me to work with this brand. I was first introduced to this brand when I was um, working at a wine shop in Menlo Park, California, and I was stocking the brandy. And I asked the bar, I asked the spirits manager, I said, I can't find where the Germain Robin is supposed to go. He goes, no, you gotta look up on the cognac shelf because everything else from California was on the bottom shelf. And I went back and said, why is it on the, why is it up there with all the other like premium brandies? And he said, well, start thinking about it. And he said, here's what I'll do. I'll just give you, I'll send you home with a bottle for a discount and you tell me tomorrow. And that was, I was a fan ever since. So it's just an honor to work with it. And uh, it really goes to kind of the, the story behind who created it. And basically the, the founding of Germain Robin was between two gentlemen that met in a really kind of 
odd sort of way. And what they did is they basically, the, the gentleman, um, the taller here, gentleman here is, is Hubert Germain Robin. And what's fascinating about him is he came from France. Obviously, the name gives you that gives you that too. But he was hitchhiking across uh, Mendocino wine country, and he's picked up by this other gentleman, Ansley Cole, who was a uh, ancient history uh, professor from UC Berkeley. And they started talking about what Hubert was really doing in California. And Hubert's family had sold his, um, his, his, you know, the, their distillery, uh, their, their house, the house of Jules Robin, uh, to a major cognac house in the 60s. And so he was either could go to work for producers in cognac, or he could figure out a way to do something different. And he really saw like, he wasn't really seeing the artisanal form of, of you know, brandy producing that he saw, uh, that he knew that was possible in the early years of cognac. So they really started, uh, he went back to uh, France, found a, a Prulo pot seal, brought it over, reassembled it. And like I mentioned before, like in 1982, this is like the first introduction uh, of pot stills coming back to California. So they were visionary founders. And one of the things that was visionary about what they did was uh, they started utilizing these California wine grapes. And it's kind of like by chance, because what they did is you know, they, Hubert initially was looking for Uni Blanc or Columbard or things of that nature uh, to 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 distill and you could find that in the central valley but you know for them they're up in mendocino and they they had like quality wine grapes in, the, in their backyard so one of the first grapes they distill is an old vine simeon and hubert was just blown away by the texture and kind of the, the flavor profile that he hadn't seen in brandy before so the very next year he distills pinot noir and this is where the next slide comes into play because he really said this is the you know the best spirit the best grape he had ever distilled and he still feels that to this day uh it's just the best grape that he had ever seen through through the distillation process and created that best base spirit to go into barrel. So, um, you know, you can look at some of the other things that, you know, they did as far as the, the artisanal sort of distilling that they, they were working towards, but it was all about doing handcrafted, you know, hand, hands-on method. And you don't see that in a lot of places uh, in the world. You're, you're starting to see it now, but back then you didn't see it before. So on our next slide, we can talk a little bit about the process for Germain Robin. So we, you know, we mentioned a little bit about grapes. Well, I mentioned a lot about grapes, but you know, when Scott talked about the grapes, uh, one of the things that uh, is really very important is we harvest the grapes at about nine to ten percent potential alcohol level. So we're looking for lower sugars than you would for a traditional uh, wine harvest. Um, once the grapes come in, they have to be fermented very quickly. They have to be fermented at very low temperatures and you cannot use sulfur dioxide because that shows up in the still later on. So if you know what sulfur dioxide smells like, that kind of gassy uh, onion skinny smell or, you know, whatever, whatever have you, uh, it's not very pleasant and we don't want that in the distillation. Once fermentation is complete, um, you really need to get the, the fermented wine into a still quickly. Now in cognac, they have till April 1st of the year following harvest to make the distillation. But I've talked to David several times about this. He says, look, if I don't get the wine into the still within 15 to 30 days, I'm losing these really precious aromatics that we work so hard to achieve by this lower level of, of phenolic harvesting that they do. Because when you think about what the grapes are doing out in the field, you're developing all that flavor early on. But you know what you're looking for in those last few weeks of ripeness is you're looking for the tannin to get ripe, the seeds and stems, things like that to get ripe. Flavor develops earlier. So once distillation, and we we mentioned the, the second distillation, the, the double distillation, and, and Germain Robin is exclusively pot still distillation. Um, the first distillation runs through, the second distillation has multiple cuts in it. And so I like to bring this up because there's a 12 hour window of time where you're cutting for a head cut, which happens fairly quickly. Then you have a body or a heart of the distillate. The very first spirit that's coming off that, that, that part of the distillate is, is, is sweet and luscious and it's the highest level of alcohol. And as the alcohol starts to drop somewhere in that 12 hour cycle, you get a 90 second window of time where the distillate goes from being sweet and luscious to becoming bitter. And it happens really fast. I've been there tasting, you know, obviously alcohol kills everything. So I've been there tasting at the, at the, at the still. So you don't have to worry about what's going on in the brandy after I'm tasting it there. Um, but you're tasting it and what happens is it's sweet, sweet, sweet. And then that bitterness sneaks in. And David says, once that bitterness comes in, man, you can't get it out. It's just in there. So it's a, you know, that's another process that has to be done by hand. Add to that the different grape varietals that we have to use. In, in cognac, they're using one grape varietal. So it's pretty, 
pretty consistent between how they put that in through the still. But here we've got multiple different grape varieties, so they all kind of slightly different in where we need to make that cut. And then everything else, the heads, tails, and this secondary cut that occurs in the heart of the distillation, you might get redistilled. Um, after that, we're looking at barrel, and we talked a little bit about barrel. So uh, aging a brandy looks very similar to me to like Rioja Grand Reserve. And if you're at all familiar with that, what it is is they put it into a new barrel for a short period of time. Here with brandy, it's about six to nine months typically. Um, then it goes into a second use barrel between one and five years. Uh, the second use barrels um, basically kind of round the brandy. You get a lot of wood characteristic in that first new barrel um, uh, time. And then after that, it starts to slow down a little bit. And then we put it into much older barrels for its, its maturation over the course of many, many years. Some of these barrels are over a um, uh, hundred years old. They came from Hubert's family. And Hubert likes to talk about the fact that, you know, it's not really the, you know, the age of the barrel maybe isn't necessarily super important, but these really old barrels impart very little wood influence on it. They still provide an oxidative environment for the, the brandy to lose some of its alcohol. But he says the barrel has a memory. It has a memory of what existed in there before. And it kind of shapes and molds the brandy into this more consistent style. So I talked a little bit about how we blend uh, and that time frame that requires. So after that final blend is made and the, the, the brandy sits for about three to uh, six months in barrel to kind of marry back together, uh, everything gets hand bottled uh, in um, uh, for Germain Robin. So moving on to the next slide, I think uh, where we are today with Hubert. Um, Hubert left the distillery in 2008 and he came back uh, in 2017 when we purchased, uh, only because uh, when he asked David Wartner, what was our goal for Germain Robin, uh, David's answer was, I always thought Germain Robin was about creating the greatest brandy in the world. And you know, if you think about the iconic image of C California brandy, if you think about you know, the, the people that basically are driving this, this new craft distilling uh, movement, it all started uh, with those early distillers in uh, 1982 or the early 80s, and Hubert was definitely at the forefront of that. So, I mean, for me, um, it's just an honor to work with this. This probably going to move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, accolades for, for Germain Robin, but let's talk about our two expressions. So we have two expressions. Uh, one is the Alambic, uh, Germain Robin Alambic brandy. Uh, the minimum of minimum brandy in that blend is going to be seven years old, and it's about a seventy percent of a base grape, which in this case is Columbard. And what's interesting about the um, alambic is I always find that it is, it's this perfect juxtaposition of fruit and oak. I always, you know, I, I can I, I never lose the fruit, and I, I never lose the oak in this, and not a, not one of them overtakes the other. And I always get this kind of orange like marmalade kind of character. David is talking to me about uh, green uh, apple he gets in it. Uh, there's a spice note from the wood, uh, but it's very, very subtle and it's used to, to, to boy it. And there's such a luscious viscosity that runs over your palate with Germain Robin. Uh, the XO is based around Pinot Noir, so about 70% of that, that great grape that, that Hubert thought was the best he's ever distilled. And the minimum age in here is, is gonna be 12 years of age. So that's the youngest brandy in the blend. Most of the stuff in the XO is coming from the, the mid 90s and the early 2000s. 2000s. And what the XO does is it kind of just amps up that 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 maturation kind of angle to the brandy. And you see the, the kind of rancio characteristic coming in a little bit. Because of the fruits that are being used here, which is Pinot Noir, you get some of that cherry. You get a little bit of raspberry, strawberry note underlying it. Uh, you get these spice components from the wood. There's definitely a, a stronger influence of oak on this on this one, but it's really well integrated. And you get this amazing kind of black walnut, like treacle characteristic that's very unique to a lot of brandies made in California. Um, our two expressions as well come, you know, packaged in pretty nice packaging. So if you look at our next slide, we can see what. Uh, and I just mentioned here um, the the boxes themselves. There's a redwood print on there. We we hired an artist named Timey uh, Barty, and she basically uh, designed this uh, wood cut print from a sinker log at the bottom of the Big River in Mendocino Forest, a log that had been down there over 100 years. And you kind of see the striations in it. And it goes back to the thing that, you know, thinking about Jermaine Robin as an iconic California brandy and the redwoods being such an iconic tree and image for California. We thought that was a perfect uh, marriage of those two things. So that's kind of wrapping it up for me. Um, and I'd like to uh, say that I'm really honored to be able to do this with Lush Life and, and Scott, who's my partner and a lot of these things we, we enjoy doing this um and uh, you know get out there and try california brandy that's all i gotta say and particularly jermaine revent
Uh, not my quote, but I use it all the time. So, um, and you can contact me as your man, Robin. Thank you all very much for coming. Wow, guys, that was great. I man, I learned a lot. I was over here taking notes in between sips, um, enjoying myself. Um, uh, everybody, I hope you guys were out there paying a very, very close attention to this wonderful presentation. We'll be back on the 28th of October, and we have a quiz that's going to be happening before that that we're going to release at uh, Leo. going to drop a link in the comments for you guys so you can get the quiz. Everybody will get some uh, some gifts sent to them if you pass the quiz. So I hope you guys are paying attention. I didn't see a lot of questions. Uh, I want to say I have a question for sure, but, Scott, I love that analogy. I'm going to steal that analogy on, on the the, the pot still and column still. I love yeah. that, dude. I gotta, I'm gonna have to steal that a little bit, man. That was <laughs> I have at it, man. I have at it. I like, I never, I, like with us, because we do this, like we know the difference, but we're trying to explain it to somebody. That's like the perfect analogy to use. So I really appreciated that a lot, yeah. man. But there was one question out there, man. Uh, and I actually had the same one. Is there a term like you know, like when whiskey used mash bill with brandy for the mix of grapes that are used? I've never heard mash bill used in California brandy, Eric. Um, I don't know about you. No, I mean, I mean, you think about where the mash bill starts, right? It starts before anything is fermented into or just dis distilled. And we don't, you know, because we're all our grapes are separate. And then the mm -hmm. blending process of what goes into that, it would be hard to like determine what the mash bill is. We generally talk about what's what are the 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 complete blends in the brandy, like what varietals go into that and such. But we don't have a specific term for it. Exactly. At least, at least I have not, I have not heard it, but. Uh, but maybe okay. we should. Maybe we should come up with a trend. <laughs> hey, you know what? Hey, let's you know. You got. Hey, look. I just want twenty percent if you come up with one, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three of us, man. Work it out together, man. <laughs> so uh, another question. Just hit the comment section. What's next for California brandy? What do you guys see coming next uh, with the uh, in the category? I see growth. I mean, I see you know, I see growth. And you, you look at like you know when you see Chris's presentation in a couple of weeks, just you know the the level and differences and characteristics. I mean, if you, you know, almost every California brand you try, uh, they're different. They're, they're, there's so much versatility there. And so they can be used in so many fashions. And uh, brandy was really the original spirit for cocktails. I mean, it's what's, you know, I mean, that's what was used for cocktails. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, you know, we saw the, you know, I mean, I think he told me at one point, like Sazerac was the original, it was originally a brandy cocktail and, you know, it's it migrated into a, a whiskey cocktail. So there's a lot of um, history there that, uh, that I love to talk about that uh, I think will really drive the interest in California brandy over the next few years. Absolutely, man. That's I love it, man. I, like I said, I this this has been from the gold rush. Like I wish I'd have learned the gold rush this way when I was in. <laughs> I probably would have <laughs> remembered a little bit more about it if I learned it this way. It was amazing. Oh, we got another question coming in. Hold on. Uh, do you guys plan to do? It's coming in slowly. Hold on one second. Man. Like we we can see it. Uh, do you plan to do oh, a Palmas cool. brand? Yeah. We plan to do a Palmas brandy. Uh, I, I'm not saying it's off the charts. I, we haven't talked about it, at least with, with my brand, Jermaine Urban will, will be a grape spirit and not a Palmas spirit. Uh, but Scott, have you heard anything about us making Palmas brandy? I, I haven't heard anything. Um, I would just say like, I know we the capabilities are in place for us to do so much R&D and some in incredible innovation for the coming years. Um, so I wouldn't keep anything off the table um, with, with what we've already seen in the last few years, which is an exciting thing. Cool, cool. Okay, I think that's I think that's about it, guys. Well, look, I want to say thank you. I learned a lot today. Got to meet you guys. I've been enjoying, you know, talking with you all all day. Um, before we get out of here, is there anything you guys want to leave uh, with the with the people? Not just Josh. Look forward to coming back to Chicago and enjoying a glass of Jermaine Robin with you. Come in, <laughs> come in the summer. Don't don't come now. Don't come now. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like cold weather. Even I'm from California, so I, hey, well, you know what? We got the next six months. We got plenty of it for you. I got <laughs> <Okay. you. laughs> right. Yeah, you know if if you're if you're in California or looking to visit California, you know anytime soon or kind of after we get in a better place from this pan pandemic, um, absolutely feel free to reach out to me. Just just slide right into those DMs. Follow me at Argonaut Scott on Instagram. I love communicating with um, any of any fellow brandy geeks out there, craft spirits enthusiasts, cocktail enthusiasts. Um, I'm, I'm always exploring California and especially Southern California where I'm based out of. Um, so we can start a conversation there and maybe see each other at a bar sometime. Cool. Well, there we have it, guys. Well, look, that was 
the Rediscovering California's Navy Spirit class. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed it. Um, if, you, if you're not following Portland Cocktail Week on Facebook, by all means, follow it. We, we have distance learning classes like this all the time. Um, we have classes on weekdays. We have an archive of classes on our page, also on our YouTube. And you can follow us on Instagram. There's no way y'all shouldn't find out about these classes. We have the quiz coming up for this class. Everybody, please make sure you uh, take the quiz. You might get a gift in the mail. And since we are on YouTube, you can go back and rewatch. You know, I'm not telling you to cheat. But, I mean, <laughs> I did what I had to do to get through high school. So, you know, <laughs> you can do what you can do to get yourself some gifts in the mail, right? So, after that, man, just jump on YouTube. Rewatch this, man. These gentlemen are wonderful. They're wealth of knowledge. Slide those DMs, like Scott said, man. We will see you guys soon. Appreciate it. Thanks. See you guys soon, man.